Welcome to day four in our Remnant Gospel Crusade. I am Rachel Sudasi, and with me I have here Francisco Martinez, partners in ministry. Now, today is part two in our message entitled The Two Gospel Extremes. The Two Gospel Extremes. Yesterday we started off by explaining that history repeats and that there have always been two views or two sects in God's movement, Amen. two extreme views, and both of them have a wrong concept of the gospel. We had explained yesterday that the conservative views, that being we use the example of the Pharisees, they were works-based, which was equating to self-righteousness in the fact that they trusted in their works to achieve uh, salvation. And then we looked at the other extreme, that being the liberals, and in, in the Bible they were the Sadducees, and this group presumed upon God's message by taking away from one was adding to it and the other was taking away from it and we see this reflected also in revelation christ actually warns john to tell the people that if any man adds to this prophecy god will also add to them the plagues that are written in, written in this book and if anyone takes away from the book of prophecy, God will take his name out of the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That is Revelation chapter 22 verse 18 and 19. So we see here clearly that Christ is addressing these two extremes. Mm -hmm. Now today our aim is to bring to your consciousness these two groups that are actually existing stemming from the church today. And the contention is over the issue of 1844 not being a prophetic year. The conservative views of the church traditionally is that 1844 was a judgment, meaning an atonement. They actually claim that Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place and began to cleanse or to sanctify the sanctuary by reviewing the books. And the liberals are contending with this view. This is a, a group that stems from the Advent movement. And their view is that William Miller got the formula wrong, the early pioneers got it wrong, and 1844 was not an atonement, was not a judgment, was not a prophetic year because they were able to prove that the atonement actually took place at the cross. Now tonight we're going to expand more on the two views, the two extremes, and we're going to show you where both of them have part right, part wrong, which makes the whole picture wrong. If you have part right and you have that wrong, it only takes a little wrong to taint the whole picture because as we know that is Satan's method of infiltration. Okay brother, this is what we will do. This is role playing viewers. Brother Martinez will hold the view of the conservative, that is the church traditional, their views from the founding fathers going up to where we are today. And I will hold the view of the liberals, that is the group that stems from the Advent faith holding the view that Desmond Ford introduced to the church. Um, I don't think he was the first, but he was the most prominent in the history. In 1989 at Glacier View Conference meeting. And it, it, I think it was like a period of a month or so that they were trying to sort out the, the doctrines and the beliefs. They had to revisit them and they had a whole team looking at the view of 1844 and whether they should 
change their stance or keep their stance. And as we know that it was kept. But at the end of this study, you will see how Desmond Ford had an accurate view. And God had used him, I believe, to correct the, the errors of the church. However, we prophesy in part. And so part of the prophecy was missing. And so it is today that this group is still not considering the element of light that is necessary to make the whole picture correct. So, brother, here we go. All right. So the first view of uh, Adventism today that we have learned from the time period of 1844 is Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place. That is what we believe and that is what we preach. That is what we think. That is our all. That's just a fact that we would die for. Okay, and how did you come up with that view? It's in the spirit of prophecy. And when it comes to the Bible... We go to the book of Daniel where it says unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Okay, Mr. Conservative, I want to show you in Matthew 5, 34, where Christ said that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. If heaven is his throne, that means that all of heaven is the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the mercy seat, which represents his throne, is. So, it could not be that Christ went from the most holy place to a holy place, because you would then be implying that the sanctuary in heaven is as literal, as physical, as is the one that was here on earth. We know that Moses said that the instruction that God gave him was an exact replica of that in heaven. However, we also understand that he wants to inhabit us as his temple. We also understand that Christ was the temple and the tabernacle which came from heaven. So the figures that we see in the physical model is a representation of the spiritual model, which are actually beings in heaven, which are actually the angels. It's Christ. It's all of the host of heaven being referred to as the furnitures in the earthly sanctuary. So that theory, Mr. Conservative, cannot be correct. Okay, you have said a lot there, Miss Liberal. However, Ellen White says, and we know that she's the prophet, that the judgment began in 1844. And besides the judgment in 1844, we know that also in 1844, really, Christ went to the Ancient of Days to, to receive his kingdom. Where does the Ancient of Days really, where does he reside? That's God the Father. He resides in a most holy place. So Christ had to have moved from a holy place to a most holy place. And how do you come up with applying that scripture to 1844? Well, our pioneers, for starters, I can't remember the name of the pioneer, but he said that he he saw it in a vision um that's that's all that's that's our adventist history well mr conservative i have news for you because the bible says in hebrews chapter 9 verses 24 to 26 for christ has not entered the holy place made with hands which are a copies of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So it's saying here plainly in scriptures that Christ entered into heaven to appear in the presence of God. He didn't wait until 1844 to enter into the presence of God where the holy place is. And it says he suffered once, which means that the atonement took place once at the cross. Why would he need to atone again in 1844? 
So would that mean that all the people between now and then forfeited forgiveness and, and salvation, they did not make it into the kingdom? This does not make sense. Why? Because you guys go too much on what Sister White say. I want to tell you something today. Sister White did not understand the scriptures same as William Miller, they did not have an exegetical understanding of scriptures, meaning that they did not understand the correct context in which certain passages was written. So they did not interpret it correctly. So I want to tell you, instead of listening to the errors of Sister White and William Miller, you need to read your Bible and see what your Bible is saying. Okay, Miss Liberal, well, I have news for you. Christ actually died in the courtyard. And if you notice, the sanctuary starts with the altar of sacrifice, and then it goes to the laver, it goes to the holy place, and then the most holy place. So if it starts at the altar of sacrifice, which is the cross, it must progress until it reaches the most holy place. And that happened in 1844. That is our history. That is what we teach. We know that Ellen White is a prophet. As we have proven, God says, as you talk about Bible, let me go to the Bible. God says that he will do nothing unless he tells his prophets. And Ellen White is the prophet for my time. When the movement was happening in 1844, he allowed a prophet to speak. So we know and we're confident as Adventists that it is correct. I was never there, but it can be proven and has been proven. And I believe it because she is the prophet for my time. And by the way, it has to be so. There had to have been a second phase because as we can see in the earthly sanctuary, the priest would go into the most holy place once a year. So as he killed a lamb at the altar of sacrifice, which represents the cross. The atonement did not finish at the cross. It has to finish at the most holy place. The priest would go into the most holy place once a year. And when he comes out, he would actually bless the people. Showing you that they what? The priest actually atoned for their sins. And that is what took place in 1844. Brother, all I hear you keep saying is what sister white saying and you are not giving me hard facts from the bible you cannot prove it from the bible because all you are going by is what sister white says let me give you more critical evidence from the word of god that that cannot be correct daniel eight fourteen reads and he said to me for 2300 Evenings and mornings, not days. That word is actually in Hebrew, Erev Boker, and that is the same word used in creation for evening and morning. It is referring to the evening and morning sacrifice. And it says, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. Again, that word is referring to a restoration of the temple. And this is about Christ's ministry where he restored the, the temple and his kingdom at the cross. So the evening and the morning was not 2,300 literal days. It was 1,150 days because it, they were referring to an evening and a morning combined. And if you don't Believe me, you can crash. Check again in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, where it says, While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, caused to fly swiftly, reach me about the time of the evening offering, because it was about a daily offering which they gave morning and evening. This 1,150 days covered the actual period from where Christ began his ministry to after his death at, at the ascension. And also the blood of Christ is enough. 
Faith in him is enough to secure our salvation. We cannot keep the law except by resting in Christ. And Christ was the Sabbath that was established at the cross. He was the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He was the embodiment of the Sabbath. Hence, he invited us to enter into his rest. Moreover, I'd like to draw your attention to this day year principle that is Irenaeus. You see, in Numbers 1434, where it speaks about a day year, that was a sentencing upon Israel. A year for every day that they spent in Canaan spying the land because of their false report, God put that judgment on them. A year for every day that they spent in the land. In Ezekiel 4, 6, it was a warning that God used a day for every year that Israel was in apostasy. And that warning and that sign or that symbol was what Ezekiel was to portray to the people to warn them of their apostasy. Hence, it is not within context of the sanctuary being restored 1,150 days. So, William Miller again did not understand the correct context of, of the scriptures and he erroneously used it. 1844 cannot and was not a prophetic year because nothing happened in 1844. It all happened at the cross and the cross is all we need to obtain eternal life. Jesus did it all. <clears throat> okay. Now, this concludes our role playing. I hope that we painted a strong enough picture to, to let you see the arguments on both sides. And now we're going to give you our objective view on each side because, as we said to you, each of them have part right and part wrong. wrong. Two extremes. <laughs> um... Well, I'm glad the role playing is over. Um, I might have perhaps maybe some weak as a conservative, but in all actuality, that was my life as a conservative. Well, brother, wasn't it all our history coming from the church, coming out of the church? Remember that this is a repeat of history. So the Jews or the Pharisees represents what the traditional church view is held uh today mm -hmm. and the other group is the Sadducees represent this group of uh, li liberals or I would say they are a present truth movement of some kind because they have a uh, part of light however um, it represents the Sadducees who also erred in their doctrine they didn't believe in the spiritual and so let us summarize for our viewers and viewers I want you to understand that so the, this message today is to highlight the two extremes that is taking place in our current time. In the next two messages, we will then break it down for you and show you the evidence as to how each part have a part right and a part wrong. Today, we are just going to summarize the points for you. And remember that it is not going to be the critical evidence that we want to give you in the next following, in the next two messages. So the nominal Seventh-day Adventist view, this is where they're in error. They believe that the translation of the sanctuary in heaven is an exact replica of on earth being literal to literal. It cannot be literal to literal. You're seeing this in Revelation because Christ is explaining about the church. The seven lampstands which you saw was the church. He's saying that the church in heaven is reflected by the church on earth. Likewise, the Ark of the Covenant that you saw at the end of the trumpets is the 144 standing with the Lamb. They are the Ark. They are the New Jerusalem represented there. It's God's people on a whole. So it is, it is something physical that is represented 
a spiritual. It's not literal to literal. It's literal to it's spiritual. spiritual. And also the other point that they are in that they emphasize too much on judgment and law rather than Christ. This is why um, the other group cor had to correct them using scriptures because the truth of the matter is that the atonement at the cross was a one-time event. If you're looking at it literally, it was a one-time event. The scripture says so. But the aspect that the church does is not seeing is the spiritual aspect. Because the cross, the literal atonement was an event, one time event. But the spiritual atonement is a process. Again, viewers, we're going to prove it to you tomorrow, how it relates uh, here. And you have to understand also that in Sister White's time, they, were, they came out of a heavy works based background. Whereas the Catholic Church used to do penances, they used to walk up flights of steps. You, are you familiar with, with that history, brother? Of course, of course, and I'm sure our viewers um, are too. Uh, yes. that's, that's basic Adventism. So they came out of that works-based orientation and they were fixated on law and judgment and works. So instead of highlighting Christ, they were highlighting the Sabbath. And we know that the Sabbath was a necessary truth to be restored. But what they and we don't had not recognized is that Christ had to restore the literal symbol in order to take them to the spiritual. So in 1888, we actually have records of this, mm -hmm. that God raised up two servants, two, the, two prophets, two messengers, Joes and Wagner, mm -hmm. to deliver the righteousness by faith uh, message which highlights Christ as the center of the gospel. Ellen White endorsed them, mm -hmm. but the church did not. They did not accept the light that was given to them in 1888. So again, the error here is that the church, because they are translating literal to literal, they are actually adding on to God's message his gospel message by having a works-based orientation we're going to be emphasizing more about this later on so the ethos for us today that you know you you keep sabbath in a certain way it becomes a hindrance to many people i mean i can recall um people from the community being turned away from the church playground because it is sabbath I mean, I myself have been told that I'm not supposed to pick fruit and swim on the Sabbath. I have heard time and time again at public campaigns that pastors telling the congregation and the visitors that they need to stop living with the person that they were, have been living with for the past 15 plus years that they have not uh, married to legal wise on paper but they're living the life of marriage for so many years that they first they either need to separate or they first need to get married before they can give their lives to the lord while christ ministry teaches us to come as you are and i will give you rest that's what christ says the holy spirit does the transformation in the person the church is actually teaching you need to change yourself and fix yourself first before christ can accept you that's not, not what they teach theoretically but in practice that's exactly what they're the message that they're giving and with specific regards to the judgment at 1844 doctrine people are actually made to believe that once their names are being pulled uh, from the books in heaven that th that it seals their destiny whether for heaven or, or for hell and that is completely erroneous can you see how we have returned to the time of the jews where we cannot understand the spiritual application because we are missing the spiritual and we are interpreting literal. We are making the word of God of none effect. Instead of highlighting Christ, we, we have that culture of highlighting the law. 
So that translates to a false gospel. It's a works-based gospel. And then on the opposite extreme now, the present truth movement, because they were raised up to correct the errors of the literal to literal translation, they are fixated on those literal translation. And I will tell you that I really had enjoyed listening to them because they have hard facts, hard evidence from scriptures. And I can see the light in the message. However, because they are not considering God's spiritual movement and the spiritual concept of the atonement, they have forfeited uh, the, entire, the entire everlasting gospel. Remember that it was the Advent movement that God used to highlight the three angels' message as a part of the gospel. And if you take that out of the equation, you are actually taking out the vital element of God's overall gospel. So if the atonement began and ended at the cross, why are we still here today? Amen. Why hasn't this world, come, this scene come to an end? Yeah. Because the, the end has not yet come. The end, there it's a whole picture we have. And Christ's movement, according to this liberal view, is stunted at the cross, which means that he began and stopped there. That brings us back to nominal Christendom, where we don't have a distinction. There is no remnant, and that is what they literally teach. There is no remnant, right. and all of us are one under the blood of Christ, one. which is not correct because we are defined by the light given to us. Amen. Also, their view is that they have nullified altogether the sanctuary system, saying that put it away, it has it is done away with, as we had shared with you yesterday, that none of God's law laws are done away with. What happened is that they are fulfilled. And they are transferred into the spiritual concepts. So if you say that the sanctuary is no longer binding because you don't want to, um, to use the, the processes to verify the atonement, you are again taking away from God's word. In light of this, let me also throw in here that the day-to-year concept that the traditional church view has used to verify the 1844 prophecy can actually be explained from a spiritual point of view, meaning the numbers and their spiritual significance can explain it. But because they are again looking at things, interpreting things literally, that gives them a, an Achilles heel in their ministry. If they can only see the spiritual significance, they can uh, more effectively prove their theories. Over this concept of Christ reviewing the records and pulling books in heaven, if you understand that under the new covenant, the law is being written on our hearts, in the old covenant, it was a written law. In the new, it is by the spirit that the law is written on our hearts or in our minds. We are the books that Christ is writing his present truth word on. And it's not a matter of whether or not we receive eternal life. That's not the issue. It's a matter of Christ defining his remnant that will take the message to the world. And this gospel will be preached throughout the world and then the end will come. So because the church have been teaching these things literally, they have totally distorted the gospel message. Meanwhile, he raised up people like Desmond Ford to correct that literal interpretation. These liberalist groups need to understand that God did not make an error with his prophets in 1844 with those he had put the light in. There is no way that such a movement that took place in 1844 could not be prophetic. Think about it, brothers and sisters.
But because we prophesy in part, we don't see the complete picture until the time that God ordains for us to see it. So, brothers and sisters, we have here on the liberal side an incomplete gospel. On the conservative side, a false gospel. On the liberal side, half of a gospel. So again, this is reflecting the warning in Revelation. You're either adding to God's word or you're taking away from God's word. So tomorrow we are, we are looking forward because this message is so liberating. It brings Amen. much clarity to one who is seeking the truth. Amen. And you will see that each group have part truth. And if they accept the other part, it will make the whole because if the if the conservatives would have a correct interpretation, they actually have a correct view of eighteen forty four but because they are translating literally, they are in error with the liberals they have corrected the literal, but they have not considered the spiritual and if you can compare that to the Sadducees who did not believe in angels and spirits. You can see that time being repeated today. Amen. Amen. So tomorrow, brothers and sisters, please tune in. It's going to get more interesting. And you will see that this message is truly from God. Amen. Amen. Let us close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you yet again for another message from your word. We Understand, O oh Lord, that we are not supposed to be in any one of these extremes or else we will end up with part of the equation correct and part wrong. And Father, you want to build a temple that you can dwell in and the temple must be a whole temple, O oh Father. So we pray that we may be able to continue to understand these things and may we be able to apply them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.